Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with an update as to what's happening with regards to China's Belt and Road Initiative. 2023 is the 10 year anniversary of the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, and China is currently hosting its third Belt and Road Initiative forum in Beijing. And this year's forum is actually much higher profile than previous ones because President Putin of Russia has actually flown in and made only his second overseas visit since the start of the Ukraine war. Which is interesting because there's actually a warrant out for his arrest relating to what's happening in Ukraine, but I think he'll probably be okay in China. And President Putin is actually due to give a speech as part of the forum. Now, when you think of the Belt and Road Initiative, you think about developing countries, countries that need to have infrastructure built, such as road and rail. However, in today's video, we're going to have a detailed look at the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think what you'll be surprised to find out is that the majority of the investments haven't actually been made into road and rail. They've been made into energy projects. And the two countries that have received the most investment are Russia and Qatar, both of whom are energy rich. And of course, the rationale behind all of this from China's point of view is that they want to make a return on their investment. These deals are all structured as loans. So the countries that are receiving the cash have to pay interest and ultimately they will have to repay that money. And China also benefit from the Belt and Road Initiative in another way, because in a lot of instances, Chinese firms are actually being sent over to the countries that are receiving the investment to actually be involved in the construction itself. So the Belt and Road Initiative isn't just a charitable gesture to help all of these countries improve themselves. It's actually a commercial venture that's helping lots of different Chinese businesses to expand their overseas reach and bring in more revenue. But one of the big problems from China's point of view is that a lot of these loans are now going into default. The credit risk for many of the countries has increased significantly, including Russia, let's not forget, because the Russian economy is in a state of distress right now. And the problem that that poses for China is that a lot of these projects are unfinished. So this is a very similar scenario to what we're seeing in the property sector in China, where a lot of the companies have got themselves into financial difficulty. And without more debt, they can't actually finish the builds. And that's the situation that many of these countries are facing. They need more money to be able to complete their power plants and airports and road and rail structures. So China is now facing a really difficult dilemma with regards to what to do with these countries that are in distress. So in today's video, we'll go through the details of what the Belt and Road Initiative actually consists of. We'll have a look at which sectors it's been investing into, which countries it's invested into, what the credit risk is for those countries, and what's happening with regards to default and renegotiation. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next six to 12 months with this initiative, and what the impact of this is going to be on the Chinese economy. But before we get started on all of that, once again, I'd like to say thank you so much for the great comments that you've been posting recently. Really appreciate that. And it really does help to stimulate debate and come up with new ideas for videos. So please keep those coming. And if you'd like to see more face-to-face -face videos that I'm not posting on YouTube and also find a way of avoiding all of the adverts, then please check out my Patreon channel. However, if you don't like Patreon and you'd still like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to buymeacoffee.com as well as YouTube Super Thanks and Membership Scheme. China's Belt and Road Initiative was first announced in 2013 and is a global infrastructure development strategy to develop two new trade routes connecting China with the rest of the world. The initial focus has been infrastructure investment in 68 countries in a bid to enhance regional connectivity and embrace a brighter future. The Belt and Road Initiative refers to the geographical areas of the historic Silk Road trade route. It's estimated that over the next 10 years, the Belt and Road Initiative will add around $1 trillion of outward funding to foreign infrastructure. This map shows the location of some of the current projects, which include Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Cambodia, Pakistan, Kenya and Greece. When you think of the phrase Belt and Road Initiative, I think the initial thought is that you assume that China is investing into road and rail and infrastructure that will join up all of the dots, that will give them this road that goes from east to west and gives new access to new markets throughout the whole of the globe. But when you look at what China has actually been investing into, the majority of the money has been invested into energy. This chart shows the percentage breakdown of the sectors that China has been investing into directly since the Belt and Road Initiative was launched in 2013. 
And the orange sector, which is by far the largest in every single year, represents energy products. And you can see that in the first year of investment, energy products represented more than 50% of all of the money put out the door by China. And whilst that percentage has come down in subsequent years, in 2020, the amount of money being invested into energy still represented over 42%. So by far the largest amount of any sector. The next single largest investment sector was transport, which represented around 16.5% back in 2013 and 31% in 2020. The development of commodity metals has been the next largest investment, and this is the yellow section. And the fourth largest sector that China has invested into is real estate. And a lot of that money has been invested into the construction of new real estate in many countries around the world using Chinese contractors and employees. So the usual form of the contracts for the Belt and Road Initiative is that Chinese companies will be employed to design and build the project and Chinese employees will be shipped over directly from China, will complete the build and will then go back to China. So this was essentially a way of providing guaranteed work to a lot of Chinese companies and employees. So just to recap before we leave this table, a lot of the investment that China has been making into overseas countries has been focused on the development of energy products and metals. In 2013, these two sectors combined equated to around 57% of all the investment. And by 2020, that figure was still above 50%. And one of the drivers for this form of investment was to ensure that China developed strong relationships with the countries that owned these natural resources in order to develop that sector in the country, but also to make sure that China could get access to these products going forward. This chart shows China's exposure by country for the Belt and Road Initiative investments. And you can see that the biggest single exposure that China has right now is to Russia with around $300 billion. The next largest country that China has invested into is Qatar with around $250 billion. And the other countries on this list that have high amounts of valuable natural resources are Saudi Arabia, where the exposure is around $100 billion, United Arab Emirates with around $75 billion, and Nigeria with around $60 billion. So I think what's really surprising here is that you would have assumed that the investment into the Belt and Road Initiative would have gone to the poorest countries in the world that needed the infrastructure building and they needed the help and the expertise of the Chinese to come and do that for them. But what we're actually seeing is that a lot of the money from the Belt and Road Initiative have gone to countries that are actually rich in natural resources and actually are relatively advanced and wealthy. So China's really been looking to develop commercial relationships with a lot of these countries rather than just putting into place infrastructure that will help to develop this notional east to west road. But one of the problems that China has with regards to development of energy products is that these are very long term investments. As you'll know if you follow the channel, it takes a long time and a lot of investment to build infrastructure to develop oil and gas facilities. And what we've seen in Russia is that the joint venture partners who came in at the start of the process, BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, have found that they put in all of this money and now Russia has ejected them from the country and taken ownership of those assets. Now, the Belt and Road Initiative investments only started around 10 years ago. So China is at the front end of this process. It takes a long period of time to recoup all of the investment that you put in for oil and gas and other forms of energy infrastructure. And the problem that China has right now is that a lot of the countries that they've been lending to are now being downgraded in terms of their debt risk. And China now faces the very real prospect of those countries not being able to maintain those loans. They might not be able to make the repayments. And also, they may not have sufficient capital and or expertise to be able to continue with those energy projects. So China's now at that pivotal moment of deciding whether or not it continues investing money into these countries to see these developments through to fruition and maybe get some return on their investment over a very long period or walking away from these investments partway through and writing off all of the money. And if we jump back to this chart, I want to just pick out the other countries that I haven't mentioned yet. Egypt is a country that we've followed on the channel. It's in financial crisis right now. The country is in distress and China has provided more than $100 billion worth of investment to Egypt. 
Turkey is a country that we've been following closely and the investment level from China is at a similar level. And the third country on this chart that I've made a number of videos about is Pakistan. And we've got a similar situation in Pakistan. The country is out of currency and it's on the verge of collapse. So looking at the countries that China has invested the most money into, we have seen a significant increase in the credit risk since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, Russia has deteriorated significantly, and that's the single largest exposure. But we've also seen a major shift in Egypt and Turkey and Pakistan. And the total amount of exposure that China has to all of those countries is in excess of $600 billion. And just to put that into perspective, that is double the amount of debt that Evergrande, the giant property developer, has. And Evergrande is the most indebted company in the world. So what we're looking at here is double the risk of the Evergrande exposure hitting the Chinese economy if it doesn't receive any of this money back. So the analysis that we've just looked at shows that the credit risk is increasing for China. The economies of many of the countries that they're lending to are in extreme difficulty. However, maybe that's not that surprising because we're sitting on the verge of a potential global recession. So maybe this is just a reflection of the times. If you follow the channel, you'll be familiar with the concept of rating agencies. And rating agencies are financial institutions who undertake analysis of companies and countries, and they give them a credit rating. And the best credit ratings that you get are usually triple A, and it goes right down through to non-investment grade and default status. And as the credit risk for a borrower, whether it be a company or a country, deteriorates, then the rating agencies will reduce their ratings. This table shows the average sovereign credit risk rating for 108 developing and emerging countries. The black line at the top represents the weighted average for emerging and developing countries as a whole. And the red line here looks at the countries that China has been lending to. The scale on the left hand side of this chart represents the risk rating with the best possible risk being at the top of the chart and the worst possible risk at the bottom. So if we look at what's happened over the last 18 years, you can see that initially the red line was below the black line. So that meant that when China started lending, it was lending to higher risk countries than the weighted average. However, that line did cross over briefly in 2006. But since that time, the risk weighting for Chinese debt has been below the average risk weighting for emerging and developing countries. And over the last 15 years or so, the differential between the two lines has got wider. So what this tells us is that the risk of the Chinese debt defaulting is significantly higher than the average risk for all emerging and developing countries. So basically, China have been advancing loans to countries that are at the higher risk end of the spectrum. And in terms of the impact of the Ukraine war, you can see that there has been a significant downturn in both of these lines since the start of 2022. But the differential between the risk for Chinese lending versus the market average is now significant. And the average risk weighting is now B minus, which is just above non-investment grade and heading towards default level. So this is a serious concern for China. If it was lending on average to the market, then the risk rating would be somewhere between double B and double B minus. But China is three points below that and is just sitting above default. So what this chart tells us is that China's debt book is in serious risk of going bad. This chart shows the share of cumulative Chinese lending to developing countries that are in distress and includes all countries whose loans are in arrears or who have restructured debt with China or that are currently at war. So what this chart shows us is that up until 2014, less than 10% of all of the debt that China had lent to emerging and developing countries was in default. So 90% of the loan book was in good shape at that point. The sanctions that were applied against Venezuela from 2014 onwards started to have an impact on China's loan book. And by 2015, the percentage of distressed loans had risen to around 20%. That percentage remained relatively stable for the next couple of years. However, from 2018 onwards, we have seen a sharp increase in the percentage of Chinese loans in distress. 
The COVID pandemic obviously had a big impact as a lot of developing countries had to close down. We saw a lot of lockdowns. There was very little productivity. A lot of countries had to pay furlough schemes to their people. So it put a lot of strain on those economies. And that, of course, increased the risk profile. It meant that countries didn't have enough capital to be able to make their loan repayments. And so we saw more countries going into default. And by the end of 2021, the percentage of Chinese loans in distress was around 40%. And since the start of 2022, we have seen another significant increase in the percentage of loans in distress. And the total percentage is now close to 60%. So the total exposure that China has currently to the Belt and Road Initiative is somewhere in the region of $1.3 trillion. And around 60% of all of that debt is now in distress. So that means that those loans are no longer performing. China will not be receiving repayments. They won't be getting paid interest. So there's now a huge amount of pressure on China to restructure these loans. And the problem that China has right now is that a lot of these initiatives are semi-built. They haven't been completed. So China's now having to face the prospect of either continuing to invest to complete these projects, to see them through to their end game and then get them to generate some income, or walking away and writing off these loans. So it really is a difficult decision, particularly because the Chinese economy is now in difficulty. And so it's not able to access as much capital as it could 10 years ago. And to show the growing importance of China as a debt provider and also the massive amount of restructuring that China is now facing, let's have a look at a table which shows the number of restructurings that are currently ongoing with private lenders and the number that China are handling. This table dates back to the late 1970s and shows the number of distressed debt restructurings for countries that have been handled by private external creditors. So these are bondholders and banks compared with what's happening right now with China. So you can see that up until 2000, China was not involved in any distressed debt restructurings at all. Between 2000 and 2010, as the number of Chinese loans in distress increased, China became the biggest single player in debt restructuring. However, over the last 10 years, that position has changed monumentally. And you can see that over the last few years, the vast majority of all debt restructurings that are being handled for countries have been managed by China. China is now by far the dominant player in all of these debt negotiations. And this obviously reflects the data that we've just looked at about the amount of loans that China has that are in distress and also as a reflection of the fact that the Chinese loan book has a much higher credit risk than the general market average. So this table really gives you a good feel as to the weight of the problem that China is facing right now. The huge majority of countries that are in distress right now have debt out to China, and China is having to restructure all of these facilities. And this table provides a really interesting insight into what's happened with the Belt and Road Initiative. The bars show the net financial transfer to developing countries in each year since 2000. And the table shows that between 2004 and 2018, there was a huge net outflow of capital from China to all of the developing countries. Now, these bar charts represent net transfers. So it's new investments into countries, less any principal and interest that's been repaid by other countries. So this effectively shows the cash flow of China over that period. So you can see that China on a net basis was investing tens of billions of dollars over the period. However, it's really interesting to look at what's happened in 2019 and 2020, because there is now a net inflow of capital back to China. So China has been reducing the amount of money that it's actually investing into the Belt and Road Initiative. And at the same time, it's been demanding repayments and the interest has been increasing on all of the loans. Over the last 10 years or so, the total amount of exposure has increased to around $1.3 trillion. And now China is taking money back from all these developing countries to pay itself interest. So in theory, as a lender, this should now become the profitable period for China. They've made all of their loans. They should be sitting back and taking the interest and repayments on those loans and becoming cash positive. 
But the problem that China has is obviously a lot of these loans are now in distress. The credit ratings have fallen. It's likely that many of the countries will not be able to make the interest or the repayments on these loans. And so although theoretically China should be getting a lot more money coming back in, in reality, it's likely that they won't get that cash because these countries just don't have the capital to pay it. And as I mentioned earlier, you then have that $64 million question as to what's China going to do. Are they going to put more money out the door to finish these projects and then get them to the point where they can generate revenue to make repayments in the future? Or are they going to walk away and leave these projects half built? And as I mentioned at the start of the video, one of the surprising things is that China has been investing a lot of money into Russia through the Belt and Road Initiative. It's been reported that over the last 20 years, China has invested around $300 billion directly into Russia to develop energy and infrastructure projects. And this table shows a breakdown of the investments that have been made over the last eight years. And you can see that up until 2019, China was still investing heavily into Russia. However, over the last couple of years, that investment has fallen significantly and the vast majority of the money that's been spent has been on construction. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the construction projects are built by Chinese companies using Chinese employees. Now, there's been a really interesting development in terms of Chinese investment into Russia since the start of the Ukraine war. It's been reported that no further investments have been made and China has now started to divert funds to Saudi Arabia and Iraq, who are two other oil rich countries that are looking to develop their natural resources further. In the first half of 2022, China agreed deals in Saudi Arabia, equating to $5.5 billion of investment. And in 2021, Iraq was the single biggest beneficiary of Belt and Road investment with $10.5 billion worth of contracts signed. So this is a really interesting development because what we're seeing here is that China is moving away from Russia. It's pulling back from its relationship and looking to other countries who can provide it with ongoing sources of oil. Now, this is a really fascinating move because if you've been following the channel, you'll know that a lot of people have been assuming that as Russia moves away from its ties with the West, it will turn to China and India and sell huge volumes of oil directly to both of those countries. And that will make up for the lost business from the West. However, if China is now deciding that it doesn't want to carry on with those relationships, then that would leave Russia high and dry. And of course, China has invested around $300 billion. And Russia, as a credit risk, has deteriorated significantly since the start of the war. Russia has defaulted on its international debts and has been downgraded by all of the rating agencies. So from China's point of view, their biggest single exposure is now at risk of going very bad. And that could be really bad news for ongoing Chinese-Russian relations and fundamentally could be a disastrous position for Russia to find itself in. Because at the time when it wants to reach out to China to strengthen the bonds, China may well decide that it wants to walk away and develop relations with other countries. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video firstly to give you an update as to what's happening with the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think one of the things that's absolutely fascinating from the details that we've seen in today's video is that the majority of these investments aren't actually into road and rail. I think that's the assumption when you see the words Belt and Road Initiative. You automatically assume that China is assisting all of these different countries in building some sort of travel infrastructure to get from one side of the world to the other. And whilst China is definitely involved in building some road and rail, a lot of its focus has been on energy, and there are a number of drivers for that. Firstly, it's providing employment to a lot of Chinese businesses because they're sending employees overseas to work on these deals. Secondly, it should be providing a form of income for China if these loans were being maintained and paid and repaid. And thirdly, it's going to provide future income as China will retain a share of those facilities. So there is a lot of logic from a commercial point of view. But one of the problems that China is now facing is that a lot of these loans are going bad. As we've seen in today's video, over 60% of all of the debt is now in some form of distress. And as we're talking about $1.3 trillion of exposure, this is a huge amount of money that China is gambling with. And the problem that China is now facing is what does it do next? 
This is a very similar scenario to what China has in its home market with regards to all the property development companies. The Chinese authorities decided that the property developers were over leveraged and in order to stop them borrowing more debt, they brought in the three red lines, which restricted the amount of capital that those companies could get their hands on. And what we've seen happening since then is that a lot of the property developers, including Evergrande, the most high profile of all, are now in a complete state of disarray because they don't have the cash to be able to finish the builds that they've started and they can't grow the businesses any further. And the Belt and Road Initiative is now in a very similar situation because without any further capital, these countries simply won't be able to complete the build of those power stations and airports and railways and roads. And half-built infrastructure is completely worthless. So realistically, China doesn't really have many other options but to continue investing more capital into these deals to see them through to the final build so that they can then start generating some cash in order to firstly pay back the loan and then secondly give China some returns on its investment. So that all sounds fine in theory, China just needs to keep handing over more cash to finish all of these projects. But the problem that China is facing is that its economy is also in decline at the moment. At the start of 2023, the Chinese economy was expected to grow at around 6.5 to 7%. However, the latest forecasts have now been scaled back to 5% and there is a question mark over whether or not China will be able to hit that number. If you've been following the channel, you'll be aware that exports and imports are both down for China for the year to date and inflation is now sitting at 0%. So China is on the verge of going into deflation, which is a problem that has haunted the Japanese economy over the last 20 years and very difficult to shake off. And in addition to those problems, the property sector is on the verge of collapsing. So China is not in a very strong position right now to be handing out hundreds of billions of dollars to all of these different countries to help complete these projects that they started a number of years ago. So the Chinese authorities are facing a very serious dilemma here. And an additional problem that they have is that the global economy is continuing to slow down. And a lot of these countries are now either in recession or on the verge of recession, which is going to make matters worse because they won't be able to make the interest payments on any of their loans. And so they are likely to default and will have to renegotiate all of the facilities. And the most likely outcome of those renegotiations is that China will either increase the price of those loans, so they'll become more expensive, making them even less affordable, or China might decide to do a similar thing to what it did with Sri Lanka a number of years ago when it defaulted on a loan for Hamban Tota port and China took a 99 year lease over that port. So basically China now owns a part of Sri Lanka and that caused some political distress for India and the USA who are concerned that China could use that port to set up a military base. So although the Belt and Road Initiative started out as a financial investment, giving debt to all of these different countries, if China decides to start renegotiating the facilities and taking control of a lot of these assets, that could escalate to become a big political issue. And I'm sure the USA and the West are now watching this situation very closely and becoming concerned that China could use this to its political advantage. So hopefully you found today's episode useful, informative and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.